Okay, I have 1.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. So good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our technical session on use of accident tolerant fuel to safely increase reactor output. My name is Bo Pham. I'm the director of the Division of Operating Reactor Licensing uh, in the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation at the NRC, and I'll be facilitating uh, the session today. The NRC appreciates the opportunity to engage in dialogue on this topic, which will cover uh, accident tolerant fuel, or ATF, and power up rates. So first I wanted to start with some general logistical items for everyone. The Wi-Fi code uh, for all attendees is RIC2024. Please remember to silence your electronic devices. All sessions are being video recorded. The Q&A portion of the session will be through electronic means for both the virtual and in-person attendees. For those of you physically in the room, please take a moment to scan the QR code displayed on the screen so you can participate in the Q&A portion later. For those joining virtually, you will find that there's a box to the right of your screen with tabs for electronic Q&A and feedback. Questions from in-person and virtual participants flow into the same queue, so the questions received will include those from the whole audience here. At the end of the session, if you have follow-up questions for any of the panelists or me, we'll be available just outside this ballroom, so please make your way to the exits uh, to have those discussions so the next session can prepare to begin. As we close the session, you are also invited to scan the feedback QR code and share any thoughts you may have pertaining to this session or to the conference in general. Now, I'd like to welcome and introduce our panelists. Scott Kreppel from the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Frank Goldner from the U.S. Department of Energy, Svetlana Lawrence from Idaho National Laboratory, and finally, Jason Murphy from Constellation. As part of their presentations, each of the panelists will give some background about their work, but their full and impressive bios are also available on our online uh, program platform. After our presentations, there will be an opportunity to engage with the, with the panelists as part of the Q&A process. I encourage you, as you listen, to submit your questions electronically per the instructions on the QR code. As many of you are already aware, ATF concepts gain attention following events at Fukushima Daiichi. Congress, through the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Modernization Act, or NEMA of 2019, provided directions to the NRC regarding ATF, defining it as a new technology that, one, makes an existing commercial reactor more resistant to nuclear incidents, and two, lowers the cost of electricity over the license lifetime of an existing commercial nuclear reactor. Near-term ATF concepts include different cladding types such as chromium coated and dope pellets. For these designs, NRC can largely re rely on existing data models and methods for its safety evaluations. Longer-term ATF concepts include silicon carbide cladding, high-density pellets, and extruded metallic fuel. For these concepts, substantial new data, models, and methods may be needed to support the NRC's safety evaluations. Both near-term and longer-term ATF concepts may include enrichment greater than 5%, 5 weight percent uranium-235, and may increase the burn-up limit to 75 or 80 gigawatt days per metric ton of uranium. Based on our continued engagement with the industry, NRC is expecting requests for licensing actions for incremental develop deployment of certain near-term ATF concepts over the next few years and batch loads covering the entire suite of near-term ATF concepts by the late 2020s. The NRC has made substantial progress to prepare and, uh, for and license ATF. To name a few of these, since NEMA, we have issued license amendments, topical reports, and generic communications to support development of ATF. NRC has also held over 85 ATF-related uh, public meetings, included, including three commission briefings. These accomplishments represent the building blocks to support the licensing of near-term ATF concepts across the fuel cycle. Additionally, near-term ATF uh, technology, along with 
recent legislation has revitalized industry interest in power upgrades. The Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 provides incentives for additional power upgrades across the fleet. In a 2023 Nuclear Energy Institute survey, it indicated over 50% of sites have indicated interest in power upgrades for their sites. Guidance currently exists for power upgrade reviews in our office instruction LIC 112 titled Power Uprate Process and provides guidance for the coordination of all aspects of reviews, uh, including roles and responsibilities for power uprate review. The NRC has a well-established process for reviewing and approving power uprate applications. This is demonstrated in over 120 uprates that we've done to uh, over, um, have been approved since 2000. However, the staff is taking further actions to shore up the infrastructure to support power uprate reviews. This includes coordination and training for staff involved and potential use of core teams in future reviews to enhance efficiency. Scott Kreppel uh, will provide more information on this topic during his presentation. Um, that concludes my opening remarks. I thank you for your attention. I look forward to the questions later. But now I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Scott Kreppel from the NRC, to continue the discussion. Thank you, Bo, and thank you, everyone. I'm Scott Kreppel, speaking through a sign language interpreter. I'm the branch chief for the Nuclear Methods and Fuels Analysis Branch. For those of you who aren't familiar with who I am, I am basically the supervisor for the branch that has the primary responsibility for reviewing and approving licensing safety analysis methodology with regards to code performance, as well as the operating operations of fuels. And so we do a lot of ATF-related work and we coordinate quite a bit uh, in terms of analyzing the codes. So Bo already covered a lot of this information in his remarks, so I won't dive too deep into the details here, but I will show you on the left side of the screen here the near-term ATF concepts that incorporate what NEMA defined as to where we are focusing our efforts in terms of implementation at the end of this decade. On the right side of the screen, you can see different types of power up rates and what we have experience with in terms of licensing and what's been submitted to us. So MUR, for example, which is to capture or uh, the recapture of uncertainty for better instruments. And then we also have the stretch power up rates, which is sort of sharpening your pencils here, if you will, to try to optimize the power plants in converting, getting additional power without a significant uh, you know, expense in terms of equipment. EPU is a significant cost uh, in terms of updating the codes. And there are some reports out there uh, to see you know, what are the economic benefits of using these different power up rates. And we can kind of you know, allude to the possibility of higher uh, power up rates in terms of percentages. We don't know what the actual plan is going to be just yet, and so that's why we have a question mark here. So here I'm going to briefly discuss our current state and what we've been doing so far and what we plan to do in the future with ATF and power up rates. Okay. On the screen here, you can see a roadmap, which includes quite a bit of detailed information here, and I will not dive too deep into this, but you can find this on our website. Uh, so on the last slide, I do have a link here for you to be able to see this map and spend some time reviewing it. Um, so on the website, uh, it does have more information about all of the different licensing actions and activities that we've been doing, like LTA, as well as implementing some batch loading of doped fuel, and other future activities with regards to supporting increased enrichment and high burn up, so on and so forth. So now with power up rates, as you can see here on the slide, the NRC has a lot of experience in terms of reviewing power up rates. And specifically the review guidance, we have LIC 112, which is a generic guide for power up rates. And you can reference that uh, specific guidance for any types of power up rates. 
We also have experience with solving complex issues that arise in previous applications. So both the licensee and NRC have more experience these days about how to resolve some of those types of issues. There is a lot of industry interest uh, in combining ATF and power up rates, and there are benefits to doing that. In terms of having, you know, instead of having a series of LAR reviews and having a very lengthy review, um, you could have a, a review of combining a power upright, and that would shorten the amount of time and duplicative efforts in trying to take a look at those reviews. So if you were to combine power uprights and ATF, then you would have a little bit of a longer review, but at the same time, you wouldn't have a series of review. And so that is something that we are able to support, and this would also support the NEMA goals in terms of the economic benefit. However, that does come with some risks. All of those reviews and review hours are essentially getting compressed into a shorter time frame. So the NRC and the licensees might have challenges in terms of supporting the review time frame. Sometimes there could be a case where everything looks good up front in terms of ATF, increased enrichment, high burn up, what have you. But then perhaps there's a problem or an issue with the power upright com component. From there, you wouldn't be able to implement ATF until you resolve the power upright component. So on this slide, uh, we're trying to look at how can we get better. So obviously, we want to be more uh, more modern risk-informed regulator. And so we pulled some historical information and data in terms of the power uprate reviews. And towards the bottom, you can see these gray dots. Uh, and those are, the gray ones are the MUR. And then the orange dots that you're seeing here are the SPUs. And then the yellow towards the top that are kind of scattered are the EPUs. With the understanding that some of those have special issues that make them more complex or more challenging reviews. So those are a bit higher than usual. And so here we can review information and see where can we support and come up with best practices. So now we're looking at what can the NRC do? Well, we are doing an internal effort to try to figure out what it is that we can do to improve power up rates and make sure that those reviews are as efficient as possible. Uh, giving an example, you know, obviously we have people who have reviewed power up rates in the past, and so we could use those individuals to be a part of the new reviews, and they could also work in mentoring the newer staff to make sure that they're ready for future reviews as well. And Bo had also mentioned having a core team. And so that concept, we would have a dedicated team with a project manager as well as nuclear engineers and other instrumental engineers that are important and integral to this process in their specialized areas. If we have this core team, we could have multiple people reviewing the power up rates at the same time and apply their knowledge. And we could do a more uniform approach to this review. So those are some tools uh, that have come up as of late that we think could help uh, in terms of confirming the analysis. And it's only been used in some cases, but we do find that it is more efficient, especially when it comes to the REI process. So this is just some of the things that we are considering now at the NRC. And we do plan to develop a project plan as well in the future, which would demonstrate what it is that we plan to do in terms of increasing efficiency. The NRC has a role to play, but the licensees also have a role to play as well. So here we have had a lot of success with ATF, and a lot of that is because we've had early engagement with industry, and we encourage licensees to come and talk to us about complex issues. The data validation, for example, and the reconstruction method was uh, an approval for MUR, and that is the first implementation, and it could be a more interesting review than some of the subsequent reviews. And with the power uprights, you can 
go beyond what has been reviewed in the past, and so that can be challenging. So we're really encouraging the licensees to engage early with us and discuss through some of those various issues so we can get ahead of them and we can avoid things like this last bullet point here, like what happened with the EPU review when we identified the steam dryer cracking issues. And that really threw a wrench into the EPU review at that time. Last but not least, I will say that the licensees should submit high quality and complete submittals, which means making sure that you're looking over previous reviews, look at what types of RAIs were asked, and make sure that you have that information provided up front to the NRC. That way we don't have to ask those questions. You can also provide more environmental evaluation information as well. So in my closing slide, you will see, as promised, that I have two links here for you. Uh, one of them is the NRC page here uh, in for the power up rates, so you can go there for more information. And the other one is the roadmap. One thing I want to emphasize is that the NRC is a regulator, and the industry or the licensees and applicants each have their own roles to play. And we do maintain our independence, however, both of us really have a big responsibility in terms of supporting efficiency and timely licensing. So we can only get there if both sides do their part. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Scott. Um, <laughs> before we move on to uh, um, the next uh, presentation, I, well, again, I, I ask, We'll hold the Q&A portion to, until the, all the presenters have gone through. Um, again, the Q&A process is done both in the room and online through the uh, QR code behind me or through the um, tab for questions and comments online. So I, thanks to the wonders of technology, can see things as they come in up here. So, um, so far I see one question which is promising, which is good, but I encourage everyone to kind of think through and, and provide your questions as you listen to some of these presentations. Okay? So next we have Frank Goldner from the Department of Energy. How do you do? I'm uh, honored to be here uh, and I'm very pleased. I'm in the Office of uh, Fuel Cycle Research and Development. Uh, my supervisor, Bill McCarthy, is here and I'm pleased to see my colleagues Madeline Feltis and Don Algama are also here, plus our National Technical Director, Dan Wax. I think most of you know that the Accident Tolerant Fuel Program deals with industry and their attempts to carry out our mandate from Congress to enhance the performance of light water reactor fuels under beyond design basis uh, accident scenarios. Uh, we were very pleased to see uh, the industry already interacting us very quickly. And, and one thing I want to say from the beginning, I think we did two things right that I wanted to comment on. One is very early working with industry. We almost were working them before Fukushima occurred. But the other one was working with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. One thing I think we did right was very early after the accident and we learned of the congressional mandate was to be meeting with people in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, and interacting very early. As a matter of fact, somewhere in the audience I see Michelle Bales, who I think I interacted with shortly after Fukushima to talk about research and development, that how we share our knowledge. So I think that's something that uh, I want to congratulate the NRC for because historically sometimes they wait till they get applicants, but we started right away very early. So we got this congressional mandate early in 20, late 2012, but 2013, uh, to do what we could do to enhance, uh, to enhance uh, our corporation. And uh, it turned out very early that we realized in doing suggestions that we got from the industry, which are listed on this slide, all the various concepts, was that when you, in order, when you enhance the accident tolerance, some of the things you do, many of the things you do also are enabling for other things, performance, uh, uh, lifetime, et cetera. And so I, I think that came out very early 
that uh, in addition to getting concepts such as was talked about on the previous slide, we, we also realize that we can have additional benefits in some of these concepts, even let the industry convince us that we should go for higher burn-ups, we should look into the possibility of enhancing enrichment to maybe uh, get better performance. So that's one of the results, I think, of the Ectum Tolerant fuel, fuel Program that I think we're all ver very proud of. And as a matter of fact, this, this is, I have three background slides before I get to the up rates discussion. But I think one of the results of our program is not only did we enable a better interaction with industry and with the NRC, but you also uh, in a, in enhanced the facilities at the DOE National Labs. Uh, I think Don Wachs likes to talk about test beds. Well, I think we made several national test beds. To me, the most significant example would be the transient reactor test facility, the TREAT reactor. That was d down for many, many decades. Uh, and, and because of its potential value to accidental and fuel, we, we put in the money to start it up. I think it was like 50 million or so. Which, by the way, now is a bargain because there are a lot of people who want to use it and they're paying more to the facility than we are. So I think this shows, again, an, an excellent example of how we use the national labs. Uh, and so you see all these capabilities here. I won't go through them, but clearly these have been reinforced and stood up as a result of our program. Okay, now this, this is kind of my bottom slide. I don't have much more to say, but uh, the whole question of up rates and power increase, uh, obviously, as you've heard, is, has been enhanced by the uh, reduction acts, the acts that have been recently passed by Congress. And, uh, and so although I use the word can here rather than should, because it's clear that if we can, we probably should. But the, the reason I say can is that uh, because of the acts, the question is, can you make more money by uprating than by having a longer life? So in some ways, while these acts are excellent because they've added money and permitted uh, extra considerations and extra concepts. They also have now put us in, in the interesting situation. And I'm really looking forward to the discussions and questions to, to help me understand some, some, of, the, some of these subjects. Uh, for example, how, how, do, you know, how do we support uh, increased enrichment, higher burn up, and also consider the importance of using these as part of the consideration up rates. And I'm looking to the industry, to the NRC, to the other participants here in the panel to, 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 to give me supportive information because as you can imagine, all those wonderful facilities I talked about a slide ago, a lot of them are getting oversubscribed. You know, when you have good facilities, if you build it, they will come. And that's what happened with us. There's a lot of people who have come after some of our facilities. And, uh, and so therefore, it's important that we understand the case and we understand the priority uh, of the people who want us to use it. Uh, that, that, that's very important. Uh, my colleague here will talk to you shortly from the LWS program. Clearly, that's not a part of NE, but we're really linked at the hip because we're working on the technology development to make the capability, but obviously uh, the LWS program, I think, is also very concerned of how we implement it. And so really, I see these two programs be very supportive of, 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 of each other. So I am looking forward to the discussion I will hear almost for the first time uh, of how we get together. I mentioned modeling because that's one of the beauties in, in, in DOE and E that we have extensive modeling program, and very early, I won't go into it, but very early they have linked up with figuring out how they can support us. And believe me, uh, they have been very helpful as we plan out our programs. Uh, so that's very important. And so again, the last point I make, it's my, again, another one of my questions, is that I know it's valuable. I think the idea of both longer life and more power, the way I read that is we have to do both. Uh, it, it, 
recognizing the difficulty because of prioritization, because of the funding. I think you, you, you are all here. I mean, recently, be, between the presidential debate and there's been a release of our budget uh, re request for uh, 2025, uh, we have lots of plans on what's, what do we do to continue. So again, uh, this uprate question will clearly span beyond. Uh, right now, we, we plan ahead to about 2025. But we're beginning to work, for, we have to work about the future also. And so clearly our program will move on, but something very interesting to us is what else can we do with the wonderful information we've developed in our regular program? And to me, uprates is one of many things, which it's clear it has a value because anything that helps nuclear sustainability, which I think we do, is important. So uh, that's, that's why I just wanted to pose uh, these consist considerations and look forward to further discussions on, on how the issue of power up rates can be used. But I'm pretty sure we do our best to support it within our restrictions and limitations. Thank you all. Thank you, Frank. Um, and next we have Svetlana Lawrence from um, Idaho National Laboratory. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Really appreciate your time to listen to us. My name is Lana Lawrence. I'm leading one of the focus areas under Light Water Reactor Sustainability Program. We did quite a bit of research back after Fukushima, uh, looking at benefits of ATF, of safety benefits of ATF, because the goal of Light water reactor sustainability program is to ensure safe and sustainable operation of our fleet, which feeds right uh, into DOE and E goal of having the mission to support nations' economic, um, energy, and environmental goals. And that is why DOE has light water reactor sustainability program that goes after those issues and uh, challenges with targeted research and development to address things like obsolescence of systems and uh, um, aging management and economic challenges with the goal to reduce either operating cost or maybe bring a diverse, diverse way to develop revenue. And af right after we did safety assessments of ATFs, we realized that there is other benefits, so like Frank mentioned, there are benefits due to more robust properties of ATF that are economic in nature. And power operate benefit was recognized early on as one of those. But there was not enough uh, business case to support additional power operate because utilities, nuclear utilities, already struggled to, save, to sell electricity at market price. Well, the pic picture changed with the recent incentives offered by Inflation Reduction Act. That this legislature provides a lot of benefits to nuclear industry, starting with the production tax credits offered for the operating reactors, extending to production and investment tax credit for new energy being introduced, including nuclear energy, and even extending further, speaking of diverse revenue, to um, utilities that produce clean hydrogen. And LWRS had a question, well, given all these incentives, is it now time? So is it now beneficial to power operate, to invest, to make these large investments in power operate? So we ran a feasibility study to assess those business cases. And there is a biz strong business case for power operate. And you can look up this report that is on your screen, and it provides the set of business cases that we evaluated. And we found that the business case becomes even stronger if this added power is used to produce clean hydrogen. And there could be a question why is that we're talking about hydrogen in the middle of discussion about nuclear power operate? Well, the reason is because hydrogen kind of similar to nuclear, is one of those unique energy sources that has this capability to deeply and on large scale decarbonize our economy. There are three large applications of hydrogen. 
First is the, we can use hydrogen as energy storage. So think about giant battery, but relatively cheap battery. So second one is a transportation fuel, especially for transportation sectors that are really hard to electrify. So think about big mining trucks. And last but not least, we're using hydrogen now as feedstock for a lot of indust industrial processes. And we can expand this application to use clean hydrogen as a feedstock for many industrial processes. And those in industries, they're really heavy on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So speaking of greenhouse gas emissions, this chart just gives you a quick glance on amount of carbon produced by various hydrogen production technologies. The very first one, that is a traditional, how I call it, uh, method to produce hydrogen. And about 95, even over 95% of hydrogen produced in the US is done by steam methane reforming of natural gas. And as you can see, it's really heavy on CO2 emissions. And compared to electrolysis, which has almost zero lifetime greenhouse gas emissions, and so when it's supported by clean energy. But nuclear here has really great advantage compared to some other clean energy sources because of our ability to produce electricity, to produce energy 24 seven, rain or shine, and also our ability to large, to scale, to really deliver on large scale clean hydrogen. And those two parameters, the availability and large scale, are very important to industrial processes who rely on constant supply of hydrogen for their, for their emission. So going back to power operates. So that is not something new. Like Scott mentioned before, NRC has approved 172 projects of power operates. And those projects deliver 24,000 megawatt thermal, about eight gigawatt electrical. But there is still more remaining to go after. We call it untapped power. So if we look at those areas, untapped power, for boiling water reactors, we have about 5,500 megawatt thermal remaining. Uh, if we go using standard approach to power uprights for pressurized water reactors, this number is even larger. It's about 13,000 megawatt thermal remaining available. Put things in perspective, that's about 10, 11 large light water reactors. So it's very significant. And putting in, in terms of small modular reactors, it's a, it can be anywhere between 50 and 100 small modular reactors that we can deliver power, clean energy in the near future. So beyond the obvious benefit of clean near-term energy, it fits directly into the sustainability of our operating fleet. We are supporting fleet with a new revenue, additional revenue as soon as the power operates are implemented. We improved economics of the plant lifetime extension and that's a great opportunity to modernize our fleet since we are making significant updates to, uh, to support power operates. And then again, the business case is really strong to produce clean hydrogen from those added power in power operates. But to expand more on the benefits, so how much more benefits? Well, there is one more, and this one is really important benefit. We expect to increase nuclear power output from 100 gigawatt, uh, from 100 gigawatt to about 300 gigawatt by 2050. So we need to double what we have today in the next 25 years. It's a very significant undertake, and we need to get prepared. So we need to re-establish and re-engage our nuclear sector, and it goes towards workforce, to supply chain, manufacturing capabilities in both equipment and materials. Um, as uh, Commissioner Caputo talked yesterday about making regulatory framework agile and prepare for these large projects, a large wave of these projects. And we really need to demonstrate to doubters of nuclear energy that we can complete this large scale project on time and on budget. So investors have better uh, take and better um, um, 
feeling about investing in the nuclear energy projects. And just to quote Ben Franklin, I love this quote, by failing to prepare, we're preparing to fail. And we really cannot afford to fail here. We really need to support, do everything we possibly can to be prepared for this large new wave of nuclear power. So again, goes back to power upright. What do we need to do as an industry? Well, first we need to start with understanding the limits of power uprights. What limit us to go beyond what has been traditionally done, which is about eight, nine percent for pressurized reactors, about 20 percent for boilers. We need to understand those limits, and we need to differentiate between the real limits that are non-negotiable for our capacity and capability of our systems versus the limits that we imposed on ourselves intentionally, right? So maybe we didn't understand all the uncertainties, maybe we didn't have operating experience when we put those conservative limits and we used bounding scenarios when we developed those safety cases. Well, we're in a different world now. We progressed dramatically through uh, in modeling and simulation area. We have done a lot of testing and experiments to understand the fuel performance. We are doing a lot of those tests and experiments to understand performance of advanced fuels. So we need to take advantage of, those, of that knowledge and that experience that we gained to highlight the safety margins that we have. And then we uh, can leverage our risk-informed performance-based approaches to demonstrate that we can go after larger-scale power operates safely. And in order to do it with an industry, we really need to work together. And that is why several DOE programs are talking with each other. We are very engaged with the industry, with Nuclear Energy Institute, with APRI, and through them we're engaged with utilities, we're engaged with fuel vendors to develop a roadmap and to identify priorities for research and development that will help us to get us there, to demonstrate how we can operate power in large scale, near term, efficiently and effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you, Svetlana. Um, next, we have Jason Murphy from Constellation. Thank you. All right, uh, I'll start, uh, as we start all presentations related to the Accident Tolerant Fuel Program, I want to start by thanking the uh, Department of Energy uh, and as well as the National Labs, uh, without whose support we couldn't be where we are. I'm not going to go so far as to Frank to give shout outs to the folks in the second row, but uh, you know who you are. Um, so Constellation's been a, a believer in the ATF program and the potential for the promise of adoption of ATF technology in the existing light water reactor fleet for a number of years uh, and look forward to seeing it bring the safety and economic benefits that we've already talked about a couple of times. Uh, you can see when you go to this chart that uh, I think it gives you a good sense of the scale and the scope uh, of our multi-year, uh, multi-cycle irradiations and not just Constellation, but you know, Southern Company has been very active. Uh, Entergy, Excel as well have hosted uh, different ATF features. So there's been a lot going on. Uh, within the ATF world, as you can see, going back to the first commercial loading in 2018, and uh, it's really just accelerated since that time. Um, and I would say what's been sort of the focus over the last couple years, I remember first going to some of the ATF meetings at the Nuclear Energy Institute a couple of years back, and the focus at the time was how can we get lead test assemblies into reactors safely and with regulatory approval in a timely manner, and that's kind of the beginning part of this timeline. Since then, we've acquired multiple cycles of in-pile irradiation of a number of the different concepts. Kind of the, the focus over the last couple of years has really pivoted towards how do we get these concepts out to the National Lab uh, Complex for post-irradiation examination. It's just been exciting. You know, a lot of us within Constellation were talking, when is the last time we ship fuel to a national lab? We know it's been done before, uh, but the number of times we've done it over the last uh, two, two and a half years has really been remarkable. Um, and it's just been uh, really exciting to see uh, that happening. Now, I will say, just shifting to Constellation's involvement specifically, you can see uh, there's just been a number of different accident tolerant fuel variants, all three fuel vendors, both pellet and cladding concepts. But then I also want to add, it, it, and Frank and Svetlana alluded to it earlier, 
the, uh, the addition of irradiation to higher than traditional license burn up. We've done that in both the boiling water and the pressurized water reactor fleet, uh, inclusive of ATF as well as standard composition fuel rods. And so that's, under, that's you know, ongoing work today in the industry. So it's just been another added focus, additional uh, work that's gone on within our fleet to see um, you know, additional work coming from the existing reactors and then getting samples out to the national labs to gain valuable data to prove the safety and effectiveness of the, of the uh, different designs. Now, what I would say when you look at all of these different concepts and all of the different reactor types, um, it becomes clear to you when you sit back that, you know, ATF is not a monolith. And I think when I first came to this a couple years ago, we sort of talked about, we used to name years and say, okay, when is ATF happening? ATF is happening in such and such year. And the implication was after that year passes and there's one reload, one feature, one vendor, one reactor type, it's okay, we can, you know, sort of wash our hands of it and go on to the next interesting thing. And while there are, as Svetlana said, there are interesting things out there, uh, I'd say my current concern, if I had one around the, the program, is we've made tremendous progress, as you can see in all the presentations today. And uh, I think we're ever closer to commercial scale deployment at multiple, with multiple vendors, with multiple technologies at, you know, fully licensed reload region quantities. Uh, what I'd hate to see is if we shifted the focus away from it, shifting you know, funding and appropriations away from it when we're so close, uh, or if we did it after we achieved it for the first technology for the first site, um, we're only a couple years off and we've shifted to saying late 2020s because different features will be licensed and commercially deployable in different years. But uh, so we've got tremendous momentum right now, a lot of positive developments. I think we've really uh, proved the proof of concept for most of the variants, for most of the vendors. Uh, but we're sort of pivoting the program to the next phase of hard work of, you know, while we've been able to license and sort of proved ourselves, proved to, you know, NRC and other stakeholders that yes, these are safe concepts. Yes, they, they belong in light water reactors doing that at the uh, the license reload level and doing it in a way that assures not just safety but also the economic benefits that we've all been alluding to is going to be some extra roll up your sleeves work and, and a lot of uh, significant technical activity and interplay between the industry the fuel vendors and uh, in nrc over the next couple of years and there's going to be a lot of uh, coordination required to do that in an efficient and uh, in rational manner so with that um well, before I shift to, to power up rates, I'll just say, you know, with so many concepts undergoing PIE, it's, it is going to be exciting to see all those results, but uh, we do have to make sure that we're all coordinating, and as we're getting that data out, out of the national labs uh, with the fuel vendors, making sure we're getting the right data in front of NRC re reviewers in a timely manner so that we can license these concepts in the... Uh, on the schedule that we're looking to get there. And I, I did want to fall back and say, we, we've all mentioned that, you know, within NEMA enshrined in federal law is the safety and economic benefits that ATF provides. I guess I'd all, I, I also think it's worth mentioning, and, and we say it periodically in the ATF community, but uh, there are other fuel cycle benefits outside of just that reduction in the price of electricity for the operating fleet, although that's a meaningful benefit and that is reason enough, uh, reason alone for us to do it is when we pair ATF features, as we will, with higher enrichment greater than 5% weight uh, U-235 and higher burn-up, it is going to reduce the stress on the front end of the fuel cycle, which in today's highly constrained geopolitical environment, I can assure you, is more valuable than it's ever been, or at least in over a decade. Uh, and there's a corresponding uh, benefit on the back end of the fuel cycle to lower you know, the annual volume of waste uh, generated by our plants. And so there's a, a sort of layer of benefits that we don't always talk about as the headline for ATF, but it, it's very real. And uh, it, it's just another reason to, to go forward with the program. So just pivoting to the, uh, the power up rate kind of segment of the presentation. Um, so I'll say <laughs> those who've been around the industry for a number of years, like most of you, uh, I, I did like Scott's plot earlier showing all the licensing activity over multi-decades on different up rates. Many of you know that a lot of that activity slowed to a trickle or you know, maybe nothing over the last five years or so as a lot of the plants in the, in the industry were challenged to, up to and including the point of premature economic-based uh, shutdown. So it's been encouraging the last couple of years to see um, that both from a policy, and we've hit the Inflation Reduction Act a number of times already, both from a policy 
uh, standpoint, better certainty and, uh, and better incentives for our carbon-free megawatts, but also just pure economics. We've seen an uplift in electricity prices uh, throughout the country. So it's, it's been heartening over the last year or two to see kind of finally a, a discrete value between policy and just, you know, market-based economics, uh, seeing the, the value that our carbon-free megawatts have to help facilitate the energy transition in our country. And so with that, there's, of course, been renewed interest in exploring what does it take to kind of any uprate plans that have been on the board before, circling back to those business cases and, and seeing what makes sense. Now, I'd say as I sit here today, uh, you know, all of us are investor-owned utilities, and, uh, you know, it's not appropriate or acceptable for us to talk about uprates of a specific unit that we've not yet shared with our investors and others publicly. And uh, so the only specific plan uprates I can talk about today are the uh, turbine generator-based thermal efficiency uprates that we've announced for our Byron and Braidwood units. Um, I think just directionally, the fact we're, we're going to invest approximately $800 million uh, over the next several years to upgrade the, uh, the secondary side of those plants to put an additional clean carbon-free megawatts onto the grid with the existing assets, at least directionally would tell you that uh, there's a business case to put those megawatts out there. But shifting to, um, you know, rated thermal power up rates, which is what most of us here are interested in, and the interplay between accident-tolerant fuel and the up rates, um, you know, last year, early last year, NEI commissioned a survey to kind of get past this problem where industry feels as though, well, we can't put out public information on what we might want to do. Um, and that, you know, was getting in the way of NRC being able to resource plan even at a high level for, you know, what plant, what year, what might be coming down the pipeline. NEI commissioned an, an anonymous study to kind of get past that log jam. And that, uh, that study indicated that upwards of 50 percent of sites have a strong interest in coupling power up rates and or implementing ATF, uh, in, in many cases both, to be able to capitalize on some of the tax incentives that we've already talked about in the, in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, as well as just to capitalize on market conditions uh, as we extend the lives of these plants, you know, in 20-year increments going forward. So I think that's helpful directionally, you know, for an NRC standpoint to help with resource planning, but I think for the rest of us just to see what direction uh, that we think this is all going to go. now. And I was glad to hear remarks already kind of on this, but, uh, you know, as from an industry standpoint, what we want to see, you know, Constellation has quite a bit. We've done every species of those uprates and, and things even in between over the years, and some of them have gone great, and some of them have been a real challenge for a number of reasons, both from a, you know, safety and regulatory standpoint, making sure we understand all the issues, also even just on the sort of, you know, turbine non-safety related side of the plant, there's some pretty significant balance of plant issues that you have to get past and upgrade and analyze as part of a power up rate. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, as we announce all these plans that we're engaging with all stakeholders, uh, understanding here's our here's the years that we're looking to act, here's what it looks the closest to. Um, you know, NEI is polling industry members, but we're going to make sure that we make recommendations to the Commission on what we believe to be the, the uh, most efficient resource uh, utilization plan to get through those. And uh, that would include things such as, you know, combining licensing actions in a way that makes sense. And, you know, Scott, you know, got to the, the heart of it that we have to be careful and purposeful the way we do that. We don't want to pin a specific ATF concept to an uprate and one of the two gets held up by some technical or regulatory issue, therefore holding the other one hostage. But in cases where there's a clear, well-trodden regulatory path, and I'll use the example of, uh, for a BWR, extended power up rate, Mela Plus implementation, and then measurement uncertainty cap recapture. I, uh, about a little over 10 years ago, I was based at our Peach Bottom plant, and uh, because they were considered link submittals, ultimately decisions were made to, um, to conduct those three licensing actions in series. And so we wound up with an extended power up rate dual unit plant that didn't have Mela Plus features and uh, left the operators in a very tough spot uh, with a very narrow window of core flow that resulted in them having to more frequently maneuver the plant, move control rods more often, have less operational flexibility, when ultimately two years later we're able to prove to all of our satisfaction we could expand the normal operating domain by implementing Null Plus and then two years later. Uh, implementing a measurement uncertainty recapture relay. Uh, many of those involve task reports and products that are, you know, start as a carbon copy of each other and then just kind of iterate and redo the same calculations. It's it's a massively un 
non-efficient way to, to go through the process. And so when there are cases like that where it makes a lot of sense for, for efficiency both for the industry, for the, the vendors performing a lot of the work, and for the NRC staff reviewing it, we have to be purposeful in uh, making sure we're taking the most uh, efficient regulatory approach to those actions uh, going forward. But, uh, but with that, as I kind of sit back and look where ATF stands relative to a couple of years ago, and power up rates weren't even part of the discussion a couple of years ago, I'd say, you know, I've been kind of um, energized the last couple of weeks. We have probably, I didn't check this stat with HR, but I think our lar largest class of college higher end, uh, nuclear engineers starting over the, ne the uh, next three months, and it's just been heartening between life extensions, all the potential power up rate work, and uh, the significant ATF work to be able to talk to people about, you know, having a full career, even with the existing light water reactor fleet in front of them. Uh, so it's, it's uh, definitely an exciting time, I think, to be where we are. Thank you, Jason. So uh, thank you to our panelists. I, I got to say, when I was listening through uh, each of your presentation, it just had a moment of self-affirmation that we did the right thing in, in proposing this topic for, the, for this year. Um, some of you long-time listeners, hopefully, uh, if, if you've been following, this is probably our third or fourth year doing a RIC session on ATF. But, you know, in keeping with, with our theme for the RIC this year of adapting to a changing landscape, I th we thought it, it, it was appropriate to pivot a little bit or, or define that confluence between ATF and power uprate because the changing landscape is things like the IRA is basically um, the Incentive Reduction Act, which has put some incentives on the table to, to, to look at uh, ways we can utilize the things that we're doing under ATF to, um, to see what we can work with uh, in adding more power to the grid. Right? So we do have uh, several questions uh, to go through. Uh, I thank you, the audience, for providing them. Uh, I will be asking them. They are directed at individual presenters, but I also uh, welcome, you know, any other comments from, from the other presenters as well, because I think the value of these conversations and having these panels is just having multiple perspective on, on sometimes open-ended uh, or not specific areas, right? So I will start, and I think we should pe have plenty of time um, with the you know, number of questions we have as well. So the, the first question will be as uh, asked of Frank Goldner from DOE. Um, is to what extent does the use of accident tolerant fuel bring safety benefits for accident management or mitigation for SMR or small modular reactor? Well, I think that's a very interesting question that we have been asking ourselves uh, as we think about the future of our program and advanced fuels is can and what are our benefits that we are developing in ATF program that can be used for other reactors, in, including uh, the small reactors. There, there are several water reactors that fit into the context of small reactors, at least four that I know of, and then there's the intermediate size uh, higher. So it's, it's a good question, and we've asked our vendors, and it's, it's part of our program thinking how to deal with what, what that can be. Any other comments from, okay, all right. Next, um, quest, have a question for Scott Kreppel. Um, thank you for your presentation. What are some of the challenges the NRC anticipates with ATF that our partnerships with industry can address? Well, first of all, I wouldn't say it's exactly a partnership. It's more like an engagement to make, make that clear. Uh, with that said, I do think that there are some new technologies that we haven't yet fully envisioned in terms of commercial batch loading. So for example, chromium coated cladding. That has been tested in LTA, but we haven't arrived to a point where we're ready to you know, roll out at a batch-wide level. And I think that's a great example of everything that's going on in terms of the increased enrichment rulemaking process. There is a lot of discussion with industry as well as other stakeholders within the NRC to make sure that these approaches to licensing and high burn-up fuels, especially with 
specific phenomena like FFRD and other things that are complicated topics, those really need to be resolved before we're able to move forward with some more of those initiatives. And I think we're doing that with discussions through industry, and I think you can see that here with this presentation today. Thank you, Scott. I apologize. I mean, I read it as it's written, but I think the partnerships may be may have um, meant partnerships within the industry, right? And so, um, just to, to to reiterate on on the the role of the NRC in the partnership, you know, ATF is you know DOE has really been charged with figuring out ways to 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 um, deploy help the industry deploy ATF. NRC is a natural partner to DOE in that in that we have we have the task of, reg of um, licensing or regulating uh, the use of the, uh, the fuel. So I think our, our role is really there is to try to not to stand in the way but engage early enough so that we can be involved and, and be aware of the developments within the industry. Okay. Well, in, in, if I could just add to that. If I could also add really quickly, Bo, I would say yes, absolutely. We do have discussions on a regular basis with DOE, and we also have workshops, and we interact with them on a regular basis. So I do think you know we are all up to date on information in terms of supporting industry efforts and developing research information through international research programs as well, like FIDES. So things like that, we are definitely involved, and we are doing a lot of work and a lot of engagement with the Department of Energy. I also understand you know, that we need to understand the basis for industry's goals in the future as well. Jason? Yeah, and I was just going to add, um, first I agree, yeah, the word, using the word partnership is probably not the right one, but I, I, I do think the industry, you know, the fuel vendors and the end users have tried to be uh, working through NEI as a conduit, have tried to be as open as possible about here are our intentions, here's where we're going. Uh, it's not in our interest to surprise the NRC, either with timing or scope of uh, a product we submit for review, so we have been uh, trying to be open, and just taking as example what Scott mentioned with FFRD, fuel fragmentation, relocation, dispersal, that's been clearly advertised as, hey, there has to be a solution there. There's been a ton of work done by the industry as a result of that to make sure that everyone's aligned, that this is the right scope of work to, to resolve that safety concern. Hey, Jason. And on that topic, in fact, the next question, and now Frank, we'll start with you, but the question is, could you comment on FFRD, fuel fragmentation, relocation, and dispersal, uh, the FFRD issue for high burn-up ATF? Well, all I know is that that's an important area in our discussions with NRC and the vendors. We all recognize that if you're going to go to high burn-up, uh, higher performance, uh, we better understand uh, what can happen in beyond design basis accidents. Uh, so uh, clearly we have stood up a testing program that will support answering those questions. Uh, we have a, a whole set of transient tests planned, et cetera, which will be contributing to understanding that well enough uh, that the mechanisms can be understood. What happens if it occurs? Uh, is it severe? Does it affect the heat transfer? So there's many possibilities of this question of, that's failed fuel re relocation dispersal. That's what FFRD is. and. Uh, uh, the industry is, of course, looking at how to address it, uh, both uh, through our experimental basis, but also through uh, statistical means, looking at the database that's available. So I can only recognize that that's important, and we've accepted it as part of our efforts to address. Okay. Next, we have um a question, Scott, if you could, could uh, take this one. It wasn't directly, but uh, it says, what ATF fuels have been approved by the NRC for burn-up to the 75 to 80 gigawatt days per megaton uranium mentioned? At this time, none. The NRC has yet to go beyond or much beyond the current licensing burn-up of 62 gigawatt days per MTU uh, rod average burn-up. And that does include ATF fuels at this time. 
Next question, uh, Jason, if you can take this one as pretty specific. Is, are the Byron and Braidwood updates for 135 megawatts electrical per unit or site? Well, as I try to do math in my head this afternoon, I, I, I believe that's combined, but I, I would have to double check that. I, I don't have that in, in my random access memory. Okay, um, next question is for Scott. Uh, with all the experience for more than 120 power upgrade licensing actions that uh, I mentioned earlier, should the NRC update and modernize existing regulatory guidance, which are over 20 years old? This could enhance future uprate licensing efficiencies. That is one of several things that we are taking a look at as part of our internal analysis that I had mentioned earlier, or internal assessment, I should say. Uh, I can't give a direct answer right now because we're still working through our internal process, and we do have a team that's getting together. It's a group of people who have knowledge of different aspects of power uprates. But what I can say at this time is stay tuned. <laughs> I mean, and I can add to that as well. Um, I mentioned in my opening remarks about the existing uh, guidance that's out there. You know, we have an office instruction on, on for the office uh, on how to perform a power up rate review. We did make that uh, publicly available earlier this year. We do intend to engage the industry on it. We have a working group within um, my division right now, working with the technical division, to take a look at how ways we can risk inform or streamline the review process, given the experience and the data we've seen from the past reviews. Okay, okay. next question is open, but it's, it's more for the NRC staff. Um, ATF a is and should be a priority and will be great for safer and more efficient, profitable operations. Have any of the used fuel storage designers and the NRC been engaged in the ATF effort to ensure that these assemblies can eventually be safely stored in a dry cast storage system? If not, what should be done to get them involved early to avoid any back end issues? Jason, I, I can take that one. I, mean, I can tell you that through EPRI, um, you know, that the, um, the plans for accent tolerant fuel and the features has been shared with all of the, the three primary uh, dry cast storage vendors. And I just say, uh, given the timelines that we're talking about, that is insertion in reactors late 2020s, you know, normally six years of radiation, then some cooling time, at the, I'd say the track record of the cast vendors is all that they'll, they will uh, easily be able to uh, accommodate back-end storage solutions by that time. I think we've been more focused acutely on kind of the wet storage, just making sure that, uh, you know, if we go greater than 5% weight enrichment that, uh, you know, our existing spent fuel storage pools can accommodate the fuel, and, and all signs are that there won't be an issue there. But, uh, you know, I, I think that we've been trying to share proactively with everyone on the back-end the characteristics of the fuel, and uh, I haven't heard of any what I'd consider a fatal flaw in, in that regard. This is Scott, if I could add. Uh, I would say the NRC also, well, let me back up for a second. So I've been branch chief for the last two years, but I have been involved with the AT programs before that as a technical reviewer uh, for quite some time now. And so uh, there was a working group that was established for ATF, as well as a steering committee uh, okay. at Bose level. And there's been a lot of involvement at the office director level that includes NMSS as well. Uh, it includes research and various partnerships with other offices. And so we all meet on a regular basis to share information at all levels of the organization. So I would answer yes, we are aware of what's happening and how it might affect one area or another. So we are definitely doing our best to make sure that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. Thanks, Scott, and I would reiterate it. You know, I am part of a steering committee um, on that uh, effort that, that Scott's referring to. There's a working group level, and there's a steering committee level, uh, level, and all the major programmatic offices within the agency, whether it's reactors, materials, as well, and security, and research, have all been involved, and we meet on a very periodic basis. You know, I think at the going rate, it's been monthly. Right? Okay. Um, Next one, I'll, I'll leave it open, but um, maybe start with, with 
uh, Jason, if you can kind of take it, your, your perspective from the industry, and, and Svetlana, feel free to jump in on this one from uh, INL, is um, if, if you can, uh, can you provide the industry's perspective with respect to the incentive window of the in Inflation Reduction Act, i.e. whether the 2032 time frame is going to be a limited window to, to get upgrade, power upgrades going? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll share. Svetlana so, probably has some good input on this as well, but we were sort of talking about this before the session. But, uh, you know, uh, nuclear timelines are different than most other folks' timelines. So, I mean, it, it is a real concern, and I know that everyone's aware of, of what is in the law. And uh, I won't, I'm not a policy person, so I won't say all, everything that would be pursued if that, you know, we we're about to run into that. But uh, everyone is very sensitive to the, uh, the timeline there. And I do think that that is driving a lot of people to act in an expeditious manner. I, so I want to Right, so there is certainly urgency there. The, I, I really should mention that 2032 is the number of the, the end date specified, but there is also extension. We should be at, on target with the greenhouse gas emission by 2032, or provisions in Inflation Reduction Act continues. So I wouldn't rely on those provisions, so we do want our carbon emissions to lower. So I'm, I'm promoter for lowering it before 2032, but we may not get there quite yet. But um, the urgency is here. So that's why we really need to, go, to work as an industry as a whole uh, to come up with efficient and effective way to, to do those large power upgrades. Thank you. Okay. Um, Next one, Frank, if you could start with this one. Um, what definition of ATF quantitatively, if there is one, what is the performance improvement criteria to be classified as ATF? Well, there I would go back to the congressional milestone or guidance to us that we should seek improvements that can be at least started to implementation in the 2020 time period uh, that can enhance the performance of reactor fuel under severe accident conditions. Uh, and and that was the starting drive of this. So we sought input from the industry, uh, and that got to that second slide that I showed with the th concepts. So it turns out that when you enhance performance under severe accident conditions, we, we, it looks like we're an enabler for other things, and that's what I'm very pleased to be hearing about here. But basically, it, we're, our mission is supposed to enhance the safety or the performance of existing light water reactor fuels under s severe accident conditions like beyond design basis uh, that can occur. Thank you. That's the tolerance, accident tolerant. Yeah. Tolerance, I guess. It, they, we used words like coping time in the early days, but now we're just looking at uh, behavior and performance, fission gas release, et cetera. And this is the next one is related to that, but, but I'll open it up because it wasn't specific. Um, but uh, the question is, can you explain how higher enrich or higher burn up fuels are safer? I think the conventional thinking is increased burn-up results in increased hydrides and resulting fuel degradation or risk of fuel fragmentation, for example. So the question is, why would we consider that um, to be th that fuel to be safer? I guess. We added that to our program uh, a few years ago, especially uh, higher burn-up came in first because the industry convinced us that some of the concepts are are not as cheap to make as normal fuel cladding, you know, zerk cladding, the normal zerk cladding that uh, they, they use. Uh, so some, th some of the things we do to enhance the performance, I mean, to enhance the, uh, the safety behavior under severe accidents, they, they co they're costly or more costly, and they're gonna add cost. And the industry very early on convinced us that things that you can do to balance the economics, and I think high burn-up was, was the first one uh, that came through. Uh, that, that, you know, we, and, and then high burn-up led to uh, uh, enhanced enrichment. 
so, so they, they came in sequentially, but they obviously linked with uh, supporting the economic viability of the concepts that are under consideration, in my opinion. Thank you. Next question is for Scott. Is the NRC considering application of an uprate or ATF decision to several plants if they are configured in the same way? For example, if they have the same fuel, RTP, operation strategy, et cetera. I would say that is something that could be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. We have reviewed some LARs that are applicable to multiple plants. However, with that being said, I personally, and this is me speaking as Scott Kreppel from previous experience, that it could be a challenge simply because there is a lot of plants that are not exactly the same. So there's a lot of deviations or variations, and it would depend on the licensee. They would need to address those particular concerns in the LARs. And my, and my sense of that question, it, it came from someone, it looks like from a RT, uh, test and research reactor background. So, I mean, I, and I could say on the licensing side, um, you know, we, we license each facility you know, with its own license, but certainly when we have lessons learned or things that we learn from other similarities between different uh, licensing uh, facilities, um, then we certainly take those lessons to heart and, and incorporate that as, as part of our efficient review right, going forward. So that's a standard practice that we do invoke as part of our licensing reviews. Okay. Um, The, uh, this, is, this is an open one for, for everyone to, to weigh in. Is there a great description on the safety and business cases for ATF from all? What is the public sentiment on ATF? Any apprehension from nuclear host communities? Just to lead it off, I can only say that when I talk to people and try to explain our program and all, I always get positive responses from people on airplanes and trains, you know, when we give our elevator speech that we're trying to enhance. Uh, and in fact, I, did, I want to add to the last thing I said. There's an interesting question of whether we enable the enrichment and the high burn-ups or those enable us. I think it's a two-way street that we're related, but th my interaction with the public and family and all has been always very positive that you're doing something to enhance the performance and safety of nuclear power as it affects its sustainability. It's an interesting question. I, I would say that, that the whole point um, of why we do these is to help the understanding and, and promote uh, mm -hmm. an understanding of what's, what's um, what Congress is charged us with, with with respect to ATF, right? And so, um, I think from a, from a tr the traditional or your typical host community, it depends on which word of the term accident tunnel fuel <laughs> you want to uh, uh, take away from it. Right. But I think that the whole concept of ATF and why Congress felt it was important enough to address the issue was the lessons learned from Fukushima and how can we increase the coping time of a facility when it's going through a loss of all power uh, scenario like they did at Fukushima. Yeah. yeah, I can add from Idaho National Lab standpoint, our engagement with communities increased dramatically in the last several years. Uh, we are planning to build several, several reactors at the, at the site. We engaged with multiple communities starting from Idaho Falls and our local indigenous communities and extending to neighborhood states and, and um, people who, communities that I would never thought would be interested in nuclear, they stay in line with raised hands saying we want uh, nuclear power in our community. So overall, not just from ATF perspective, but even advanced nuclear technology, it's a dramatic increase in public acceptance of nuclear. Thank you. 
So the next one, it looks like for the NRC staff. So what NRC safety requirements would become unnecessary through the use of ATF? So this is not something that I could necessarily speak to directly as of right now. Obviously, we have the increased enrichment rulemaking process ongoing as we speak, and so that is specifically intended to take a look at the safety requirements, which may need to be updated to better reflect ATF. And I think many of you already know that we are done with the public comment period, and we just closed that recently, and we will be proceeding with the proposed rule here soon. Uh, we will be doing that at the end of this calendar year, and that will be when most of you will find out what it is that we have in mind in terms of those specific rules. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Scott, and I would echo that, you know, I don't think we, in any rulemaking process, we enter it saying what's not necessary, but really the, the whole conduct of the rulemaking process is to really look at, at an existing rule in some cases, what the technical and policy or, or uh, policy basis behind or regulatory basis behind that rule and look at it again to say, is it needed at the, at the time, right? And so I don't think the, uh, we go into the, the, the process thinking of what's unnecessary, but so much is gonna do a full systematic evaluation of, of, of the rule itself. Okay. Um, Frank, if you can take this one. What range of power up rate levels enabled by ATF, or is enabled or are enabled by ATF using LEU um, plus, and do you expect to see an existing PWRs? It's a very specific question. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't think I can answer the specific question because I think that's still, you know, we're still, as I said, we're evaluating how and what we can do in our program to support uh, the up rate question or the power. We know it's important, uh, but uh, I've heard numbers like 20% or something like that in, in power level. If that were the case, it's clear that, especially with the impact of that Inflation Reduction Act monies, uh, that, that can be very valuable. So, so I've heard numbers as high as that, but the numbers I've heard mostly up to now is, is, is at least the people with the PWRs hoping to go from 18 to 24 months, you know, which was the early justification of the value of what we're doing. So there, there may be a competition, but I think different, different utilities will use it in different ways. Yeah, and that's what I was going to start with. I, I think every plant has unique constraints, both in the nuclear island and on the turbine island, and that's sort of the starting point. I, I think Frank's right. I think many of the pressurized water reactors that haven't been able to economically transition from 18 to 24 month cycles, it's a huge enabler there. So I, I think that'll be a large focus for you know, almost a third of the U.S. light water reactor fleet. As a result of that, for other plants that have either already done an upgrade or already at 24 month cycles, then it just becomes, you know, do you optimize your existing fuel cycle economics by loading less fuel? Uh, you know, do you do a power upgrade? It's really just a cost benefit. Every plant has a couple of limits that it runs into. It's just about does ATF allow you to kind of get past that limit? So I, it's really going to be plant specific. Right, and power upgrades levels. Fuel definitely is one big piece of it, but there are also limitations on the um, balance of plant side. There are limitations on some source terms that are related to fuel, but not not directly, uh, you know, in, directly connected to it. Uh, so there are multiple, and like uh, Jason said, there are multiple conditions that are very plant specific. In some cases, you may be limited by the grid. So it's not even your plant, it's the how much power I can add to the existing electrical infrastructure if I want to operate power. So some of those considerations, that they, will, uh, they will be taking place when utilities consider power operates and the size of power operates. Thank you all. Um, this is interesting, a very open question here. Um, but what, uh, it's actually to not directed at anyone specifically, but it says, what is the expected increase in tolerance or coping time with ATF? And I, I will start by saying that 
as the facilitator, I absolve you of saying anything that's overly committal. So, right, so I, I can start actually because we looked at the safety benefits of ATF right after Fukushima, and it was kind of a blend because the safety limits stay for the traditional fuel, right? So we would still don't have explicit safety limits that are ATF specific. So what we did, we used the safety limits for traditional fuel and we did um, systems analysis, thermohydraulic analysis using ATFs. And we did see increase in coping time. It wasn't too significant. Uh, so some, in some cases it's about 30 minutes, but in some other cases it's just a few minutes. So that would not really make you to change your way you operate the plant, or change your accident sequence analysis or uh, success criteria for your plant. We did see dramatic increase in hydrogen production, which is uh, one of the considerations that ATF, or oh, one of the concerns that accident tolerant fuels address. So that was really dramatic uh, reduction in the hydrogen production during accident scenario. Uh, but we, I suspect we will increase a larger coping time increase when we do know the real safety limits of um, ATF specific safety limits. At what point fuel starts to melt and, melt and starts changing the properties. We don't have that information yet, and that's why we really work closely together between DOE programs to address uh, that as part of the portfolio of R&D that needs to be done. I, I could add that obviously when we first started the program, we were thinking of longer coping times that people talk of now, hours, days. And as a matter of fact, I remember a, a study by Professor Corradini uh, saying that whatever coping time you have uh, with the type of things you're considering with coping, you'll, 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 you'll get a benefit. You'll delay because you'll let decay heat have decayed. Because of the decay heat source is decaying. Whatever coping time you have, and I always thought that was important. And, and I know the last, I didn't hear minutes, but I've heard hours. But to me, a couple of hours isn't so bad if you have to plug in an extra power source or something. So I've always found coping time interesting, but very hard to quantify. Yeah, and I was just going to comment. I mean, it, it's well, it's hard to say what ATF is going to give us when we haven't selected which specific concepts we're going to license and deploy. But I think some of the studies we're talking about have proven that even when you just pair it with, uh, you know, flex equipment as an example, yeah. there's very meaningful benefits. And you know, again, hours matter when you're doing things under the type of conditions that we're talking about. So I think NEI's you know published some of the the studies related to that and shown that is it is hours in some cases, but that could be, you know, hours that are that are meaningful from a safety perspective. Thank you. And we have a um, fairly lengthy question here, so so bear with me as, as I read through it, but it's, a, it's like a thoughtful logic flow here. Um, the new draft license renewal generic environmental impact statement provide, provided in SECI 240017 evaluated operating nuclear power plants as it relates to updates, to updates in the quantification of accident source terms, increases in license reactive power levels, i.e. power upgrades, and increases in fuel burn-up levels, and concluded that the probability weighted environmental consequences of a severe accident were small. Plant-specific population dose risk for all operating plants have now been performed for all plants using level three PRA analysis during the license renewal SAMA analysis. And the effects of these changes can be calculated generically and on a plant specific basis using level three PRA population dose risk values. These analyses coupled with substantial efforts from both industry and stakeholder, industry stakeholders and the NRC offer a robust framework for evaluating the level three PRA population dose risk associated with severe accidents on a generic as well as plant specific basis uh, for, several of the ATF, for several of the ATF considerations. My specific question pertains to whether the NRC staff could leverage these level three PRA analyses to provide insights into risk profile associated with new accident tolerant fuel technologies. Given the thorough review and approval process undergone by these analyses, could they potentially alleviate some of the uncertainties surrounding ATF implementation? So um, the question is, it, 
you know, a, a shortened, a shortened version is, can the NRC leverage the effort that's been put into the level three PRA development to benefit uh, our look at ATF, right? So we, we do have members of the staff, Don Pombrose, I see you grabbed the mic already, so appreciate it. Yeah, this is Don Palmrose. I'm a senior rector, um, engineer in the environmental COE and a member of the ATF working group. Um, it's a standard practice in NEPA and in the NRC's um, environmental review um, process to leverage um, prior environmental reviews, such as what was done for um, SAMDA, SAMDA reviews and license renewal. Um, and so um, we look at, at leveraging that information to the maximum extent possible. Um, and practical. Hey, Don, Don, could you speak into the mic a little bit more so make sure? Okay, is that a little bit better? Thank you. Um, and so when, um, for a site, um, most current uh, license renewal, uh, final supplemental environmental impact statement that should be um, examined to determine whether the information and findings it contains can be applied in the particular licensing application for that specific site. There's other conditions that could be considered as, as part of that. So, you know, whether it's the part of the, the PRA analysis that's been updated, that would, would need to be looked at to see if it's, it can be, a, a, um, you know, need to be reassessed in that as a new significant review in, in that subsequent licensing action, such as in deployment at ATF and uh, power up rates. Thanks, Don. Okay, and I think we've made it through all of the questions uh, that were submitted. We have less than five minutes here, so I think we're doing great on time. I, I do, again, want to thank the panel members uh, for your presentation and, and fielding a lot of the questions, interesting questions, and having the uh, uh, wonderful discussions about those. And so I thank you again for, for being here. I thank you for the audience for being here as well. Again, I'll point to the QR code Please uh, scan that and provide any feedback on the session and what we can do better in the future. And with that, I'll close out the session.